the physical book, as we've come to call it, is to resist the challenge of the e-book, it has to look like something worth buying and worth keeping. That was Julian Barnes back in 2011 when he won the Man Booker Prize. Now, I have a question for you. Do you still buy physical books or e-books? I'm asking you that question because in this video, I'm going to unbox Hilary Mantel's The Mirror and the Light. And then I'm going to talk about some of the many qualities that make a physical book worth buying and worth cherishing. And later in this video, I'm also going to discuss some of the qualities that make this Wolf Hall series some of the greatest works of literature that we've ever seen. That's all coming up. Uh, I am Samuel Durham. A few minutes ago, I got this parcel. So, let's open this up and see. See what's inside. It looks big. Let's see how good it is. Oh, wow. Oh, wow, look at this, look at this. Now, this really is a thing of beauty. Julian Barnes, I know exactly what you were saying back in 2011. Just look at this. The whole thing is a beautiful object. And then just look at the design. Just look at it. This really is a work of art. Uh, this is designed by Julian Humphreys, who is a veteran designer at... Uh, for the state and Harper Collins, he's he's designed Wolf Hall as well. He's also famous for Reservoir Thirteen. Now, what do you think of this design? I think now, if you buy this book in the UK or India or Sri Lanka, you'll be getting this copy, right? This is what it will look like. However, if you're in the United States, you'll be getting this cover. Yeah, this cover. Uh, it's awful. What do you think? I think it is awful. The mirror and the light is anything but jolly, right? This cover, what the hell is that? What is going on there? Uh, the blue, what is this blue? I mean, I would describe this blue as jolly blue. The novel, this novel is anything but jolly. Uh, Henry Holt, uh, if you're watching this, I know a girl called Sophie. She is nine years old. She's very good with her iPad. She could have designed a better cover in two hours. All you have to do is give her some ice cream and some peanut cookies. That's all she needs. Two hours, she could have designed a better cover. Now, if you want a designer for the trade paperback, I can get Sophie to do that for you. Right? This, this cover is an insult to Dame Hilary Mantel. If you're watching this in Canada, now, readers in Canada are going to get a different cover. The Canadians haven't got a better thing either. I mean, their cover looks like somebody just going and took a photo of a castle's door and just put some letters on it and put it on the front cover. That's it. That's their cover. So USA and Canada, you got to do a lot better. right? I'm not happy. Not happy. Thank goodness we got this. Thank goodness for Julian Humphreys and Fourth Estate, eh? The title of this novel, The Mirror and the Light. What do you think? I like it. The phrase, the mirror and the light, is drawn from one of Thomas Cromwell's letters. Uh, it is also a guide to the structure and function of the novel. A mirror is held up to the past and new light is cast on previous events. Apparently, size is everything. So now we're going to weigh this book. Now, let's start by weighing the first ever novel in the Western canon, Cervantes' Don Quixote. Now, last year, uh, Salman Rushdie wasted a lot of my time uh, getting me to read uh, Keyshot. Absolute waste of time. Salman, I'm getting tired of defending you. That was a lot of pretentious tripe. Now, now how about Don DeLillo's Underworld? Uh, one of my favorite novels of all time. But don't you think that Delilo has been in decline since Underworld? And now comes one of the most bonkers novels of all time, Lucy Elman's Duck's Newberry Port. 
And now, let's weigh the mirror and the light. Let's see how big this thing really is. Now, are you one of those readers who pays a lot of attention to the dedicatee? Uh, I love looking at that. For example, uh, Jonathan Franzen uh, dedicated most of his novels to his literary agent. How sad, Jonathan. How sad are you? Now, Hilary Mantel, on the other hand, she has dedicated uh, this novel as well as Wolf Hall and Bring Up the Bodies to Mary Robertson. Who is Mary Robertson, you might ask? Well, uh, Mary Robertson is a Thomas Cromwell scholar. Way back in the 1970s, she wrote a PhD thesis about Thomas Cromwell. And in 2005, Hilary Mantel began a friendship with this lady who, who at that time was working at the Huntington Library in San Marino in um, California. And their relationship uh, and the, the PhD thesis uh, were some of the inspirations behind the Wolf Hall series. And, uh, and this is really significant because when I was at school, age 14, um, Tudor history was taught. Uh, but I don't remember uh, Tudor history being this sexy. And uh, Thomas Cromwell, for me, was a pantomime figure. Um, and Mrs. Wilson, my history teacher, didn't say anything about how sexy this era in English history really was. I mean, she got us distracted by uh, teaching us about Henry VIII and the dissolution of the monasteries and the English Reformation, all boring to a 14-year-old boy. I mean, most of the boys there, I mean, if Mrs. Wilson, if you had told us there's a lot of sex in this era, right, we would have paid a lot more attention. I had to go to the English classes and read D.H. Lawrence to learn all about sex. Yeah, thank you to Lady Chatley. So ladies, if you think I'm a bit messed up, I have to blame D.H. Lawrence. Anyway, that's another video. That Tell me in the comment section, are you the type of nerd who pays a lot of attention to the epigraphs in a novel? Well, I love looking at that because that can say a lot about, again, just like with the dedicatee, it's, it says a lot about the author and the author's intentions. But in the mirror and the light, I feel as though Hilary Mantel is using the epigraphs as if they were chandeliers and this is a mansion. Now, the first one is by a 15th century French poet called Francois Villon. And then the second one is, is a line from a play called Noah's Flood. Now, I never heard of this play. Uh, and this play is could have been from the 1400s or early 1500s. So if you're one of those nerds who knows a lot about that time in English theatre history, right? This was before Shakespeare. Could you let me know in the comment section exactly where it's coming from? Because I never heard of Noah's Flood and it's really bugging me. Now, sometimes some novelists do make up an epigraph right? Uh, William Boyd has done that, Nabokov and a few others, they do this. Now, Dame Hillary, if you're watching this, you better not have tricked us. That better be a real epigraph, real quotation. Now, so far, I read about 280 pages uh, into the mirror and the light. What do I think of it so far? I have too much to say. Uh, I'm sure I'll be making a few more videos on this sub. Uh, but two things stand out. Firstly, I want to talk about the prose style. One of the things I really love about uh, Hilary Mantel is, is that great English prose style, which is both simple. It really is profundity masquerading as simplicity. In her memoir, Giving Up the Ghost, she has mentioned how much she admires George Orwell. And then in another interview, she has, she has said that when she was a child, her favorite novel was Kidnapped by Robert Louis Stevenson. And we all know that Muriel Spark is a really inf important influence on Hilary Mantel. They're both Catholic novelists, both English. And so her pro style is a combination of all these things, but it is cinematic. Now, Robert Louis Stevenson never lived to see the age of cinema. But when I'm reading uh, Hilary Mantel's novels, I feel as though I'm watching watching a movie right in front of me. It's, a so, it's as if uh, Hilary Mantel is watching a movie and she's just transcribing what she's seeing. I mean, it's not just because of that present tense narration the screenwriters use, but it, it brings something a lot more urgent and magical.
The second thing is the mood of the mirror and the light. Now, this story takes place between 1536 and 1540. And this is a time when the English language is being changed. Uh, Thomas Cromwell is pushing the Bible on the king. And we know that the Bible and the English language will change in such a way to rebuild England's identity. Hilary Mantella said in a recent interview that the English language was being mediated to the English people through the, through the Bible. And in the late 1530s, you can feel the tremors of a big change that's coming that will expand the English language because now uh, the people can talk to God in their native tongue. Thomas Cromwell died in 1540. That's not a spoiler. You should know this. But we have to wait another 24 years before the arrival of a boy called William who will go on to revolutionise the English language, uh, theatre, literature and storytelling and become the world's greatest writer. But what was happening in the 1530s are really important. Thomas Cromwell's role has so far been neglected, really, because if you think about it, the English that we speak, uh, we owe a lot to Shakespeare. And thanks to Hilary Mantel and no thanks to Mrs. Wilson, we now know that Thomas Cromwell played a key role in the evolution of the English language. If you enjoy watching unboxing books videos like this one, made by a classy, erudite, sophisticated guy, uh, I've got some really bad news for you. Stephen Fry is not doing those videos. So instead, you got me. Now, I already made two unboxing videos, uh, unboxing Lucy Elman's Dutch Newbury Report and unboxing Elif Shafak's novel with that long-winded title that I can't remember now. And... Uh, I'm all, I would also be making an unboxing video of Suzanne Collins's new novel, also with a long-winded title. And the links to both those videos are in the YouTube card over there and in the description below where you'll also find the sources. Now, I already made uh, a video about Hilary Mantel, which describes, uh, or which discusses all the lessons that I learned from her that I found inspiring, and I hope you find it inspiring too. All those links are down there in the description below. Uh, if you found a lot of value from this video, do please click that subscribe button and also click that notification bell. So then every time I upload a video, you'll get to watch the video as soon as possible. And also leave some comments. Uh, uh, do you, are you still buying physical copies of books? Or are you buying e-books? Uh, are you a nerd like me who likes to look at all the things like word counts, pages, the weight of books? You could tell me, Samuel, you are so sad. I don't look at books like that. Uh, you could tell me there are far more important things going on in the world right now than to look at books in this manner. Apparently, there's supposed to be some virus that's killing a few people. Uh, North Korea is still jerking around with those nuclear weapons. And Katy Perry's got a new album out, which is not good. So we all got problems. I want to leave you with a passage which relates to something that I said earlier about how the English language is being changed. And we know that Shakespeare will come along and he will change it and revolutionize it. But a lot of the key events are taking place right now in the 1530s. Now, uh, I'm going to try and travel back to the 1530s England. Uh, I think that's a better time than we got right now. So are you ready to join me? Let's enjoy the great prose of Dame Hilary Mantel. It seems to me, Barnes says, our prince thinks the purpose of scripture is to allow him to marry new wives. You claim he will license the Bible. So why does he delay? He sweeps the engravings together like a pack of cards and tucks them in his writing box. Thomas More used to say, old translators crave something from their text. And if they do not find it, they will put it there. The king will not let us use Tyndale's version. We are obliged to pass it off. Give other men the credit. If Henry is waiting for a translation with God's thumbprint on it, 
He will wait a long time. Luther would labour three or four weeks on a single phrase. I never thought he would get his work out, and yet, two years back at the book fair in Leipzig, he was selling a complete Bible for under three guilders, and they have reprinted twice since then. Why should the Germans have God's word and not Englishmen? You may stare at the text till your eyes bleed, consume a stack of paper as high as Paul's steeple, but I tell you, no word is the last word. It is true, no text stays clean, yet one must part with it, send it to the printer. The trick is to get them to set the line right to the edge of the page. It does not make for a good appearance, but no white space means no perversion by marginalia.